Hello, welcome back. Today's chapter, we're going to go over how to purchase a home and also go into details examining the options that you have to finance a home purchase. First, we're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of buying versus renting. And we're going to figure out exactly how much of house you can afford. And while you are ready to look for a house, we're going to um, list and identify all the important factors that you need to consider. And then we're going to dive into uh, the details about different types of mortgages. And we'll actually do some actual calculations about mortgage payments and introduce the concept of an amortization table. These are all things that you need to know before you talk to the bank. And then finally, we're going to detail all the steps that is involved in buying a house. Before we started looking at buying a house, let's first take a look at renting versus buying. Let's first look at the advantages of renting. Uh, first and foremost, renting is a lot easier and cheaper to move. Um, the other obvious um, advantages of renting is that you have much fewer responsibilities. If you have a problem, whether it's a heat problem or um, a plumbing problem, electrical problem, all you have to do is call up your landlord or the rental agency and they'll fix it for you. The other thing that it goes along with the fuel responsibility is also no surprises. So all your uh, taxes, maintenance costs, everything is included in the rent. So you do not have to budget on your own to take care of any of those surprises. There are also obvious disadvantages of renting. One of the ones that is often mentioned is your, your rent is expenses, so your money never goes towards building up equity. We'll actually take a look at that a little bit more uh, in a minute um, to see whether or not this is true. A bigger disadvantage is the restriction on your lifestyle. Uh, a lot of times uh, rental apartments or rental units do not allow on pets and also some other activities. Um, you cannot make changes to fit your lifestyle um, and then there's also no tax benefit because all your rent is just expenses. Uh, perhaps the biggest disadvantage of uh, renting is that you have no control over future rent increases. So all of these are some of the disadvantages of renting. Now, Many of the disadvantages of renting obviously are advantages of buying a home. Uh, first and foremost, uh, buying a home will enable you to live the life that you want to live, uh, including owning a pet, making changes to the, to the space. Um, so this is really the biggest advantage of buying a home. As far as equity is concerned, um, that is an advantage of buying in the later years. Um, in fact, we're going to go into details later on uh, in this chapter on the concept of um, building up equity. And we'll learn about that through amortization tables. Uh, but for now, realize that in the first five to 10 years, most of your mortgage payment mostly go towards interest. So you do not get a whole lot of advantages in the first five to 10 years. But once you move past that point, then you will start building up equity. Another advantage of buying is that currently the U.S. tax code allow um, property tax and mortgage interest to be tax deductible. So you gain some tax benefits compared to rent, which is not tax deductible. Another big advantage of owning a home is that if you take out a fixed rate mortgage, again, if you don't understand these terms, we're going to explain all of them later on then you get a, uh, the payment is fixed. So you do not have surprises of increasing mortgage payment. The biggest disadvantages of buying is expensive, especially if you have to move. It's very difficult and expensive to move. The other is the responsibilities. You have to plan, not just take time to do the repair and maintenance yourself uh, or or hire your own contractor, you have to plan for paying for those repair and maintenance. And overall, um, it is more expensive to rent, uh, to buy a home than to rent a home. So uh, 
the disadvantages are cost based. You have some offset. So most of this is because it's more expensive, but it is offset by some tax benefits and also uh, the advantages of a better lifestyle and a fixed payment. Now, for a lot of us, our first step is to live independently. So if, uh, if you're a college student, then there's a chance that you are living with roommates or even on campus. Um, even as uh, we enter the workplace in initially, we oftentimes still have to share expenses. So before we move, make the big jump to owning a home, let's take a look at what do you need to get your own space first. So to rent your own place, uh, you need to make initial financial commitment. So let's take a look. Most rental agreements requires a first month's rent, last month's rent, and security deposit when you sign the lease. Uh, security deposit can vary, but oftentimes it is an extra month's um, security deposit. So let's take an example. Let's say the rent is $2,500 per month. So the first month's rent, the last month's rent, and security deposit. So altogether, you have to pay up three months in advance. So $2,500 times three, that gives you $7,500. So you have to have $7,500 up front before you can sign the lease. Another thing to take into account is the length of lease. Again, this has to do with the stability of your job and the stability of your lifestyle. Shorter lease terms will provide more flexibility, but the rent is typically higher. Uh, a lot of lease are one year lease. However, if you end up having to quote unquote break the lease, meaning that you have to leave before the leave, lease term is up, you may be responsible for paying rent for the rest of the term. So let's say you rented a place for one year and then six months into it, you get a better job offer and have to move to another city. Then you may be liable for paying the remaining six months of the rent that you don't get to stay in, plus you have to get pay rent for the new place that you get. So uh, think about the commitment before you sign a lease. Another important thing to take into account is what is included in the rent. Ask questions and pay close attention to the details of the lease. Um, does the rent include heating, cooling, and other utilities? If not, then you have to take that into account and include them in your budget. So that's another thing that you want to take into account. When you assign a lease, the first thing they, the rental agency will do is to check your credit history. So your credit history will be important and as well as your credit score. If your credit history is too short or if your credit score is not high enough, you may need someone to co-sign the lease. So someone who has a better credit score. Finally, we uh, take, uh, think about rental insurance. We'll talk about insurance in an entire chapter on itself, but just keep that in mind as something to take into account. The good news is that rental insurance is typically uh, relatively inexpensive and it's something good to have so that you don't have to worry about um, surprises. Once you have stayed at your own place for a little bit of time, you might be ready to think about buying a house. So let's take a look at some of the uh, things that you may want to think about. The first is what most people thought about when they think about saving for a house is the down payment. So how much do you need for down payment? Um, it varies. Um, we put, I suggest in here that 20% is the ideal. Uh, why is it? Um, the main reason is that if you have 20% down, you don't have to pay something called private mortgage insurance or PMI. You hear the term PMI a lot when you start looking for a house and talking to mortgage companies. Um, what PMI is, is that it's an insurance for the bank. So it's not insurance for you, it's an insurance for the bank but it is you who pay the expenses. It usually costs between half a percent to one and a half percent of the loan amount each year. So it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but let's take a look at an example to see what does that translate into. So let's say you take out a $300,000 loan and the PMI is 1%. So 1% is somewhere between half and 1%. So 1% of 
$300,000 is $3,000. So that is $3,000 per year, right? And if you divide that by 12, that translate into $250 each month. So that's not a trivial expense. In fact, it is quite expensive to have PMI. So uh, private mortgage insurance as $250 per month to your payment. And this is not added to your equity. This is not part of your loan. It's just an added expense. And because of that, we say 20% is ideal. We understand that not everybody can save up to 20% for a down payment. In addition to PMI, there are also other expenses at the time of closing. Uh, these include closing costs, prepaid expenses, escrow tax, and home insurance. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand all of these terms. We're going to go over them uh, in details in this chapter. Uh, right now, the key takeaway is that you need more than just the down payment. So let's take a quick look at how much would that be. So closing costs typically range from 2 to 6% of the loan amount. So once again, it depends on how much you borrow. So the loan amount is the key determiner, determinator here. So again, let's take a look at a sample loan of $300,000. If the loan is $300,000 and your closing cost is somewhere between 2 to 6%, let's be conservative and say it can be as high as 5%. So $300,000 times 0 0.05, that gives you $15,000. So this $15,000 is added to your down payment. So that is important. So if you have a, uh, let's say, $60,000 down payment, save up, then you have to add another $15,000 to it, and that may make your total cash up front to be $75,000. So how much can you afford? The first thing you need to look at is your budget. Good thing that you're in this class and uh, using this book, we already went over how to make your budget. So you already have a head start in this process. The other thing to keep in mind is remember um, to take into account repair and maintenance. Um, all the other fees, again, we'll talk about what homeowners association or condo fee are, uh, as well as insurance. Um, so factor all of those in besides your mortgage payment. So this is very important. So in addition, that's the key. Uh, another good thing to do is to get a pre-approval for a mortgage before you go house shopping. Uh, finally, don't stop saving when you buy a home. So you want to keep in mind your other long-term goal, uh, your other long-term financial goals, such as retirement, uh, maybe children, college saving, uh, or a vacation. Uh, all those are important things to keep your life in, uh, life in balance and not just a house. Here are some rules of thumbs, and uh, we're going to take a look at um, each one of them in more details. So first of, first of all, how much can you afford? A rule of thumb that a lot of people use is that you should not buy a house that is more than three to five times your annual household income. And we actually will do a deep dive in the next video on, well, how valid is this rule of thumb? But that is the general um, recommendation. Another way to look at how much you can afford is to look at your debt to income ratio. So, um, the so the suggestion is that your debt payment, so including your mortgage and your car loan and every other loan that you may have, should not be more than 30 to 35 percent of your income. So we again we learned this uh, earlier on. This is called the debt to income ratio. And in finance or mortgage pal. Uh, Jargon, this is sometimes called a DTI, DTI ratio, and you'll hear that a lot. Some of the other things to keep in mind are somewhat common sense, but a house purchase is a very emotional experience. Um, it's very hard not to buy the house you love, but just remember that you don't want to buy the most expensive house you can afford. 
because you want to remember that there are a lot of other costs. There are closing costs, down payment, and there are other fees that goes along with buying a home. Another thing that we oftentimes forget is that house prices can go up, but they can also go down. You, what you don't want to get yourself into is a situation where the value of the home is less than the amount of the mortgage that you own on it. Which leads us to the most important part about home ownership. Be realistic about your job stability. Moving is very, very expensive. Let's take a look at how expensive it is. To sell a home, a seller typically pay between eight to 10% of the house value. And that includes the real estate agent's commission, closing costs, title search for costs. We'll talk about those details uh, in, in this chapter as well. So that's how much it costs for someone to sell a home. For someone to buy a home, we already talked about the down payment and closing costs. And an average buyer pays 46% in closing costs and fees. So this means that if you buy or sell a house that is worth $400,000, so in this case, you are not upgrading, you are just relocating. So you sell a house in, in your old job location for $400,000 and you buy another house for $400,000 in your new job's location. The transaction costs alone can be as high as $60,000. So this is just your moving cost. So keep that in mind as you consider whether or not you're ready to buy a home. Uh, these are just some of the rules of thumb. We'll, pause, we'll end the video here. In the next video, we're gonna go into more details to see whether or not uh, these rule of thumbs apply to your particular situation. See you soon.